very much, Melissa. Good morning and welcome to our celebration with SPHIS alumni fellow Kimberly Hawkins, who graduated with a Master of Public Health degree in 2013, a member of our community advisory committee. We're very grateful Kim was able to join us today along with her colleagues, her friends, family, members of the Universal community. I'll turn the program over to uh, Benz, who will introduce our fellow. Dr. Benz is the founder of Confluent Health, a nationally recognized expert in private practice, physical therapy, and occupational medicine. He also has very strong ties with the UofL. Current trustee and a former chair of the UofL Board of Trustees, at large member of the UofL Athletic Association Board of Directors, and the current chair of the UofL Research Foundation. Dr. Benz. Thank you. I Thank you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that, Paul. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the School of Public Health and Information Sciences recipient of the 2023 Alumni Award, my friend and colleague, Kim Mascaro. Kim received, as you just heard, her public health, her master's in 2013, and she's been an incredible, highly accomplished professional in healthcare for over 30 years. But that and in her entire history and background, you could actually read that online. But what you can't read about and what I'm here to tell you about is the Kim that we know. She's an incredible spouse, mother, grandmother, marketing and business development expert, and a public servant. Kim's a partner at Confluent Health, the fast-growing musculoskeletal healthcare company in Unicorn that is proud to call Louisville its home. In Kim's day job, she's been instrumental in a company that has over 3,000 points of service across almost every state in America. While a student in the MPH program, she worked on a capstone product project that eventually became a nonprofit of her founding called Choose Well Communities. This is a company that impacts lives in Louisville through early recovery of women with children, but that's not enough. Choose Well also provides access to affordable housing and a host of community support services of women and their children through their fifth birthday. She continues to be deeply involved in this incredible mission. Kim's well known for her mentoring, mentoring of young women in particular in their careers and particularly how to overcome the challenges of rising to executive positions. In 2020, Kim was recognized by Louisville Business First as part of the publication's annual enterprising women's program. Kim lives in Prospect, Kentucky with her husband, Joe, who's an oral surgeon and a graduate of UofL School of Dentistry. They have six children and are anticipating the arrival of their ninth grandchild. While Kim is being recognized today and being honored as the 2023 Alumni Fellow Award, she is also contemporaneously being honored and recognized by me and all of her partners at, Conto at Confluent Health for her incredible tireless devotion at making every one of us better as well as the entire company better. We would not be where we were at, where we are at without you, Kim. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased and honored to introduce Kim Mascaro. Thank you, Larry. Um, and Larry, what you can't see is that I'm up here next to a cord, which everybody knows I'm not the most graceful. So we will try not to fall. <laughs> try not to fall. And I also brought my phone up here, not because I'm expecting important calls, but because I'm going to try to keep myself on track time-wise. Uh, okay, so timeline, just real quickly. Time started for me in 1963. I celebrated my 60th birthday in August. So, um, so I would say my formative years were through 1981, and I'm the oldest of four children. You can see those big, long legs there. They haven't changed. Okay. And then in 1981, I went away to college. I graduated from high school. So that through the 96 was really college and early career. I put this picture. These are some of my girlfriends from college, but you can see all the shoulder pads from the 90s. And so, uh, and then, uh, then 96 through 13, I was doing consulting. And that's when I pursued my Master of Public Health from the University of Louisville, go Cards. And, um, and then in, th in 13, we established Choose Well. Um, and I had been working with what was Confluent Health before then and Confluent Health became itself at 2015, but that's kind of where, where I've been the last 10 years. Okay, so early life, 
quickly, Ken and Judy, I don't know if they're on here. I know my sons are here, but mom and dad will watch this. I, I didn't want to help you, mom, with the technology this morning. So I didn't tell her about this, but she, you know, she's watching this. But, but home is where life begins. So these are my mom and dad. I was born when they were in college at Bowling Green State University. My dad was on football scholarship, and he um, then continued in his football world. He taught uh, biology, he taught health, he, and he taught phys ed, and he was the head of um, high school football coach at age 24. So he's in the Ohio High School Coaches Hall of Fame. So that's kind of where I get my go, rah, rah, uh, that comes from dad. Mom was my banker, so she, she, went, uh, she stayed home when we were really little and then went back into banking and was a retail banker, managed banks there. So that's kind of where I get my economics mindset, my brain mindset. She says that one of my first sentences was, can we afford this? So, um, so um, and one of the things that she focused on was, you know, not everyone has the same privileges that you do. And look, growing up um, with a father as a teacher and my mother was a retail baker and there was four children, that there, were, there weren't a lot of extra economic resources, but we had absolutely everything that we needed. So that's what mom made me think about every day. Okay, all right, that's my mom. All right, here's some pictures, family and fun. So at the top, uh, there's my love of my life, Dr. Joe Mascara. So, and so, and you can see my, my two sons, you can see when I looked like a crazy woman in the 90s, and then as them, uh, that's probably 2020. Uh, that's our eighth grandchild up there on the right, and the ninth one's due in January. Um, and then when I got Joe, I got four additional bunch of children-in-law and eight and seven grandchildren. So um, beautiful, beautiful family. I, I thought back at, when I was 13, I wanted to have 13 children. And so actually, I've kind of done that. I was 12 anyway. So anyway, it happened. Here's yeah. mom and dad now. They're fabulous. And one of my granddaughters. And so for fun, uh, Joe and I, I like football. He says that's one of the things he liked about me. I you know, started early, but I counted up a few years ago. I've probably been to nearly 700 football games live in my life. And so anyway, I like it. I could turn it on on TV if I'm not paying attention. It's just good background music. Um, and then we love to do concerts. We most recently saw Diana Ross. Ain't no matter high enough. Anyway, um, at the Palace. I've been gardening. One of my good friends is here. We're gardening. I was gardening in my 30s, so it's not that I'm an old lady that likes to garden. I was doing it when I was young. Love to garden. And then I've got dogs. We love it. And I make sure I keep the dogs so that I can go trail hiking. And then Joe and I do a lot of traveling. So that's a little bit about me. It's always, I like to know people's backstory before. So went to undergrad. I did Center College. That's what brought me to Kentucky. Uh, applied Mathematics and Economics. I was a resident assistant at Center. Um, and this is back uh, to you students before internships. But Judy, my mom, I was like, but you need to have the right experience and you want to go into healthcare administration. So I worked in a skill, as a skilled nursing facility at the state. And, um, uh, and then I also was a bank teller. Before computers, I put that up there. This is when we'd have to run a tape, you all. That's how old I am. <laughs> And that's all. And, and you had to balance every day. And if you didn't balance, you had to pull out your little tape and figure out where did you not give the right $20 bill. Anyway, so that's my undergrad. Okay, how am I doing? Oh. All right. So early career in consulting. So when I got out of school, um, I worked for an insurance firm, a property casualty insurance firm, and I became a property casualty agent, licensed. I had to go to Frankfurt, take tests, etc. Um, wasn't that hard? Um, but anyway. Um, so that, that's what I did for the first couple of years, but I always wanted to be in healthcare. So I went to work for Appalachian Regional Healthcare. Um, Appalachian Regional Healthcare was the first hospital system in the U.S. Nobody else was doing this hub and spoke. So you can go back and check my facts on that one. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. If they were established, they were established. You know, check my facts. You know, um, so, um, but they were established by the Appalachian Regional Commission. And so they, they centralized services like laundry and, and other administrative services to serve these hospitals out in, in, uh, in Appalachia. It was a really good place to learn. It was a great education for somebody that grew up in Cincinnati, kind of in suburbs and city, to really get exposure to this, um, to this rural, rural healthcare world. From there, I went to Continental Medical Systems, which owned a, a, a hospital called Lakeview Rehab Hospital down in Elizabethtown. Where's my Hardin County guy? Yes, there you go. Um, and so um, that, that's where I met Larry back there, and, and that's where I got to know physical therapy and rehabilitation. Um, the other, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, so, but, but the important thing to know there is that when you look at um, so what happened was this was in the late 80s, and you know... Um, that if you've got your little healthcare history hat on, 
all of HMO, all of that legal, that that uh, the, the framework for for how those were regulated, all came out in the 70s ish. So it took a little while for things to kind of get on. So in the 80s, the mid to late 80s, I was working in rehab, and my CEO was like, "Well, Kim, you understand insurance? It was probably casualty insurance, which is workers' comp. So it's not health insurance, but either way, you understand insurance. Can you figure out this managed care thing?" And so that was a really good way for me to figure, I mean, figure out managed care, understand who was doing what and how they were doing it. And so from there, I went to work for um, what Fraser Rehab Center, which was part of Jewish Hospital at that time, which is now part of the University of Louisville. And, and then I started doing provider network development with underwriters. And then I worked very closely then with uh, a lot of, of, of folks who were in physical therapy. And so, um, so during that consulting piece, Larry, um, Larry was instrumental in all in, in um, being partners in several of these companies and then I got to go in and work with all of them and then they all came together and formed Health. We'll talk about that in a second but but um, but it was a really great place a really great place to be and that's really where I understood that that these payers had to been to develop networks to assure that they had the right providers in their networks that provided access for their members for their pay for, for who I look to be to see patients. So um, you can, you know, you can denigrate the insurance world, you can denigrate the provider world, but most things start with the right reasons in place. So anyway, early career consulting. So then I was like, I want a master's degree in all this much better. And oh my gosh, Val had this master of public health program. I love the diverse student body because when I went to undergrad, it was plain vanilla. Um, and so um, I love the diverse student body. One of my colleagues had moved from... Um, one of my classmates, she'd moved from India to be in the program. I had somebody from Norway, from Palestine, um, Rwanda. My fun story about Rwanda, this is the gal in the middle from Rwanda. I was like, Yvette, where are you? I'm from Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Yvette, you are not from Eastern Kentucky. Where are you from? So she was from Rwanda and had moved here to be in the, in the MPH program. That was right when you all started doing the, um, uh, the aggregated application Yes, yes, yes. And so you got uh, access to all kinds of students from all over the world that had not known about the University of Louisville. And then where come here. I found that to be beautiful. I took four years to do it. So I kind of had my first year and then I had three senior years with everybody that was graduating it was fabulous. Got to know all these folks. And the beauty of this is I was able to do my practicum over two years. So I will talk about that a little bit. Um, but being having two years to do a practicum meant that I could really dig into a subject and a challenge. And the, and the practicum became became Choose Well Communities at the time. So I graduated in 2013, 10 years ago. It goes fast. My hair was blonder and longer then. OK, um, and the other thing I want to tell you about is, is my history of public health is that I am so lucky to have a bunch of longevity in my family. Both my grandmothers lived in 94, and both of them were alive when I was doing my master's in public health. Why is that important? The two pictures on the, on the left are my grandmother, Hockman, so my dad's mom. That's her with her brothers, and then that's her there with her husband when she married him at 17 in 1930. The other one is my mom's mother, Ruth. She grew up in Frametown, West Virginia, and she'll tell you she got it the hell out of Dodge on the um, on FDR's WPA program and went to nursing school. And so I worked in Washington, D.C. But they were able to talk to me about grandma wasn't neither of them were alive during this. Well, grandma was born, the far one, during the Spanish flu pandemic. But she could tell me stories about her mother and the challenges that happened right there in her neighborhood with the, with, with, with the flu pandemic. This was before our pandemic, so it was just kind of interesting and very theoretic and historical and never going to happen to us, but either way, um, it was, that was Grandma's take on that. Talking about family planning, she was like, oh my gosh, in 19, in, in, even in 1936, she said, you can talk about family planning sex um, with anybody except for your husband, not your mother not your doctor, and most of you all know, but many of my colleagues don't know, that it was illegal for doctors to talk to their patients about family planning back in 1915 or whatever, when health really started. So we've come so far. And I was able to make sense of that and make it real for my, for my um, friends at, in my MPH program, because this wasn't just history. This was like my, my grandmother, I mean, my cool grandmother. Anyway, and then my other, my grandmother, one was a teacher, and she, we, I was talking about the increasing prevalence of ADHD. Oh, old problem, new name. I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, just really focused on that. So anyway, that's the history of public health. And then, you know, one of the classes I had, I had to write a paper about every one of the ten, the ten great public health achievements 
of the 20th century. And so when you look at this, this is really when you see that public health is not just about healthcare services. I'm thrilled that I'm in healthcare services, but public health is not about just about healthcare services. There are, and this is also why it's important for people that aren't necessarily clinicians to go into public health. I did get one discouraged, when I applied to, to graduate school, I did have one clinician say, you should not do public health. Everybody should have, uh, ever, should have a clinical basis before they go into public health. And I'm like, in economics, we need people that understand math. We need people that understand safe workplaces and engineering and all these other kinds of things. We need all kinds of disciplines to understand and to be able to promote public health. Okay, so, so because of this, um, one of my professors, um, Rob Steiner, do y'all remember Dr. Rob Steiner? He was like, I was talking about what am I gonna do with my degree? I was doing consulting, I was already working, et cetera. He was like, you boy. I took that, I took that to heart. Oh, Dr. Steiner was use your voice, tell these stories. Most people don't know these kinds of stories and they're not gonna study it like you all do. And you're gonna get surrounded by other people that think like you do. And so I'm in this other world and I can use my voice to explain these kinds of things. A little more complex, et cetera. So anyway, so that I've taken that to heart. Okay, so today's agenda. So now we're gonna go on to confluent health, musculoskeletal health and changing care pathways. All right, my dad said, my old football coach, work harder than everybody in the room. So I have tried to do that. And I've done that with my buddy, Larry Benz, and so many of my colleagues that are here today. Um, and so and one of the big things I learned from Larry was done, not perfect. You know, chasing perfection is never gonna happen. So let's just get it done, let's get it out there. We're gonna, we're gonna innovate, we're going to um, iterate, but let's just do it. And so um, that has been, one of the many things I've learned from Larry. The other one that I want to draw attention to was he published this book. In, uh, he had been working on this for, for about 10 years, but really focusing on call to care and, and, the, and compassion. So Confluent Health was one of the first companies to sign the compassion charter that uh, the mayor put in place back in 2014-15. Um, but really focusing, this really talks about the fact that when um, when you have connections to patients, you get the clinical outcomes that you need. All of us that are in clinical world know this. We've done this forever and ever, but there hasn't been a ton of good literature on that. And Larry did a really, really nice job here of aggregating all that and then talking about how you actually put that into practice in your clinical settings. So um, I'm really, really proud that all of our clinicians uh, go through training. Every non-clinician that works in one of our clinics does the same training. How they are spoken to at the front desk changes how they, how they get treated back in the, in, in, in the, so anyway. All right, so Confluent Health, this is October, you know what they are All right, so last year we um, treated more than four, four million patients, and that equates to from a low back pain surgical cost prevention, four million dollars in savings of low back pain costs. We've got nearly 7,000 employees, 4,200 therapists work in 1,200 clinics that we either own or that we provide services for. Um, and then we are in care locations across the US providing prevention services. Uh, so kind of PT, early PT on steroids. And then we were established in 2014. This is a list of some of the, the partnerships and clients that we have. We are all over the country. We operate under um, all of the local brand names. We know healthcare is local. People want to be local. And we have partnered with all of these groups to either through acquisition or organic growth. Um, to provide all these services. And so these are some of my friends and some of them are here today, but I can tell you that if you make friends everywhere you go, you will have so much more fun, so much better work if you are connected to all those folks that you work with. And so, so some of these folks I've worked with for 30 years, 25 years. When you've worked with somebody for 25 or 10 years, you know how they're gonna respond. You know what their strengths are. You also know what their what, you know, things are gonna be a problem. You're gonna have to, maybe cover or make sure they go in a different direction. It makes such a difference in organizations to have that kind of longevity. And so anyway, so these are some of our folks at work and um, I just wanted to show that. Okay, so musculoskeletal challenge. So musculoskeletal expenses have continued to rise. This is from the Kentucky Family Foundation, um, um, but to, to the point of, of, of 400 billion. Um, estimated for 2022. And it's really challenging to manage musculoskeletal care because uh, there's fragmentation. People don't know where to start necessarily with uh, the care. 
they, the, uh, uh, incentives are misaligned. Sometimes the most expensive care um, is incentivized to be first. And so, uh, I mean, through, through, through not necessarily, inadvertent design, obviously. Um, access barriers, people don't know that they can and should use. This. A lot of folks are really trying to solve musculoskeletal with digital tech solutions and categorizing members and, and doing it with and, and, and don't have the human connection with the physical. That's the outcome. So physical therapy is the solution. So this I talked to I use this slide with employers and payers across the country all the time. And I and so you'll hear my one minute spiel about this. But these first two studies I'm gonna talk about are exemplar of a plethora of research that is of, that is out there about when physical therapy is first for the same conditions for some for when you're looking across severities of illness, et cetera. When physical therapy is first, you get reductions in ER visits, you get reductions in imaging, you get 90, a 90% rate reduction of getting prescribed an opioid. This is from a really large study by Boston University with 300,000 patients that were in that. This other study is a PT first versus MRI first. So again, for the very same diagnosis at the very same severity of illness, when you start with PT first versus getting an MRI first, you spend way less. Why is that? Well, your physical therapist will tell you, they're like, oh, this is normal. That's a wrinkle on the inside. If I, if I imaged every spine, I would, do, I would do rehab on every spine. Not every spine's got pain. We can't do it by the, by the, by the imaging. So we start with PT first and you get reductions in surgery, you get reductions in injections, you get reductions in spine surgery, spine specialists of any kind, and ER. Now, you combine those things with the diagnostic accuracy of physical therapists. When you compare an orthopod and a physical therapist against an MRI finding, those two clinical, or those two diagnostics are statistically equivalent in their ability to diagnose. And they are double that of other kinds of practitioners. They are double that of family, of family medicine physicians, of occupational health physicians, of nurse practitioners. And this makes sense. It's what they do all day. All they do is see orthopedic patients all day. The other folks don't do that all day. And it's also why in the military, you see a PT first if you have an orthopedic issue. And so, and then if you need surgery, then the PT sends you to the surgeon. And then you see that highly skilled surgeon who can focus on the people that really need his or her surgery. Okay. And then when you put all this together, you see these kinds of reductions. And these are reductions within our um, own population of, of up to 42, 50% reductions in total cost of care, not just in the cost of PT, the total cost of all the care. Okay. So what I wanted to tell you about is a few little things. I, Larry, if you're watching, I've got a few of your slides up here, buddy. Just want to let you know. Okay. Um, this is a study. So Larry's, Larry's presenting this um, in a national meeting next week. But, but one of the things that I found is that when I'm talking to employers and when I'm talking to payers, they're... They're interested in the published literature, but they kind of want it. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you do? Did you were you able to replicate the exact same results that's in the published literature? So this is what we found. So we, you know, we do it with our own employees. We study, but we, over five years, we've done this. We've been uh, monitoring the um, the impacts of of encouraging PT first. So um, and we were doing that with with copays and other access and, and a lot of education. And this is the kind of increases that we've seen. And the number of members who are getting PT first. And this is the reductions. So 1,630 are your total cost of care if you start with PT first versus 3861. And then across various body parts. Um, and then what that really so that's great. It's wonderful. It's huge. And then when you think about this, what does that mean for, for their average costs go down 59%. And that's due to surgical rate reductions and imaging rate reductions. So happy to share more information about this, but, but it's pretty powerful stuff. So this is really why the last couple of years we've been working on a product. I'm from healthcare. Hold on. A product called Mus called called Movi Health, and where we are really working to. Are the only national musculoskeletal program, digital, in-person, and virtual care all together. 
it's really hard to do. That's a reason, there's a reason why people didn't do it. Crossing state lines with credentialing and, um, and licensing and then and medical uh, EMRs, et cetera. Try to do this. It's, it's really important that we do it, but um, it's been very difficult. And so we actually, this is uh, fully in uh, clients, et cetera. So we're really thinking about care management by a real doctor of physical therapy, um, evidence-based pathways, and then giving them all of the digital support, all of the all the technology that you need to be able to do all that, that people expect because of the retail world. So um, so we put that all together. It's an really investment on our part, and we are really, really proud of it. So it looks a little like this. We make it really easy to schedule. You get an initial visit, and then you either go all virtual, all in clinic, or in a hybrid um, way. So results, um, you know, we are early in results because we're a couple years in. Um, but early indicators are lower downstream health care rates, published literature, a typical mix of patients like you see in a clinic. When we look at our folks who, on our own employee population, who are not clinical, do not work in a clinic, they work someplace else, They're, about half of their cases are, are all virtual. They've been able to get outcomes with all virtual care with physical therapists. And then the risk adjusted cost reductions are in the 30. That's exactly what the data scientists said. That I should say. <laughs> Just saying. I'm like, what can I say? How do I, you know, say this so that I'm telling the truth and people understand it? And so that's what we're seeing so far. And that's really, really exciting. So what do you need to do? Get PT first, okay? These are the two partner brands that we have in the Louisville area, Pro Rehab and Orthopedic Sports and Physical Therapy. So anyway, so get PT first. If you hurt, but get PT first. I am a freak of flyer. I mean, I'm, I'm treated for sciatica. I'm treated for my shoulder hurt. I mean, you know, whatever. But but they've kept me out of an, uh, the OR. They've kept me out of imaging. And they've kept me at work. So those are all really important things. And they've kept me, now I'm working on floor to stand. Larry's on this, all you PT buddies, floor to stand so I can get up and down with my grandbabies easy from the floor. If you're having trouble getting up from the floor, you need a little PT. Okay. Um, all right. So last agenda item. Choose well community. Okay, so this is my heart. This is where my heart is. Substance use disorder, sobriety, and parenting. So as I mentioned, uh, part of my MPH was this practicum project where we envisioned a program for mentoring relationships that accompany mothers of low socioeconomic status uh, to change their family's directory. So, okay, you professors out there, when you helped me, because we worked on the logic model for all this, we put, you know, did the, did the, um, the the literature search, et cetera, all the, all the pieces. Um, They're like, you are putting a lot of responsibility on the mentoring. I'm like, well, the, the data is mixed on mentoring and its ability to get outcomes. And it is a little mixed. I probably still, I haven't really studied that part in the last five years. Maybe there's some new stuff. But anyway, but that's where we started. And so we did this. I did this with, with Stephanie Barnett. She's here today. She was my practicum advisor, dear friend. Um, and she is now my, my, in, in the CW, our, our Choose Well community co-founder. But, but we, she would start every Friday morning. I would go meet with her every Friday morning for two years. Um, what if we were 10 times older? What would we do? Because one of the things that we are challenged with is that in our organization, in your organization, all of our organizations, we're always told you can't boil the ocean. You just have to do it really quickly. But what we've learned in working with our families is that because we aren't supposed to boil the ocean, we expect them to. They have to figure it out. They have to do all of it. So that's kind of the, where we start. Okay. So Choose Well Community is a decade of choosing well. Um, so I'll just point out a few little highlights. But, but Volunteers of America's Freedom House was the first group we talked to Baldwin University, JTCC, uh, Sullivan, a, a bunch of groups to talk about. You've got mom, families, primarily moms, that are non-traditional students that might need some support. How could we do this? Anyway, so everybody was saying, you go talk to them, you talk to them, talk to them. So people go talk to Volunteers of America. So Stephanie called me one day. She goes, so I just finished with Volunteers of America. They want us to do our, this program for their Freedom House moms. I'm like, oh, who are, who, who are they? And they are moms who are, who are going through recovery, a program while they're pregnant and parenting and they're giving the kids with like, do you know how hard this is going to be? And so anyway, that's where we started. Um, we still funded the program for the first couple of years. We had friends that really wanted to, to donate. So we established a 501c3 very begrudgingly because we knew there were lots of 
501c3s in Louisville, and we didn't know that anybody needed more. Um, but what we did this for was because we really, it became evident about these four flat tires. Um, and we're going to talk about these flat tires. So when you are parenting preschool age children or babies, and you are in early recovery, help you get that way through these, through these treatment programs. You are healthy, you feel so good, and you come back out, and there's no safe, affordable housing. There's challenges because your education may not be where it needs to be and job readiness, and so then, then what's your purpose in life? Why are you here? You can't find adequate, accessible child care. And finding compassionate, responsive health care that understands where you've been with your history of substance use disorder is not easy. And so we knew all of these things were, were such big issues. And you need help with this for years. We came from families, Stephanie and I came from families where we would surround each other. You had lots of resources. People would focus on you for years. When we get people in rehab programs, they have 30 days or six weeks, and then you're supposed to go back out and figure out how to make it all work in an environment where you may only have the same skill set as everybody else in that environment, and, that's, and that skill set is what got you into the, into the SUD anyway. So, so we continued on. So we established Choose What Communities. This is on your table, but this is what we call kind of the, our place map. But we are the only organization in Louisville that's providing access to long-term permanent housing that we're then also focusing on. So thinking it, so, so Stephanie is here, she's, she's impatient and demanding. Those are huge compliments from me, okay? I love it about her. But she went to the Louisville Housing Authority and said, our moms need access to these Section 8 vouchers. They cannot be 17,004 on the list, which was one of the reasons why she went there, because we had a real mom who was 17,004. And her children would have been 12 by the time this happened. We know brain development happened so much in the first three years, and things that we just can't even imagine. So, so they gave us these vouchers, and the, and, the, and the way they get the vouchers, they have a covenant with Choose Well to raise their families to, in a substance-free home. So they have this covenant with Choose Well in order to get the, the voucher. Leanne, Leanne, um, Yost, I was gonna say, Leanne Yost is here. She's our executive director. Um, and she she can speak to all the ch all the challenges of this, but but really putting in place you know all the things that somebody needs. Once you you know the, the safe housing you gotta have. You don't know where you're gonna sleep this week. You can't worry about these other things. But once you get here, you have to get the other things in place: health and wellness, education and workforce readiness, and then and then. So and then I kind of walk through the challenges over there a little bit. You can read that yourself. So um, we talked about the, we were adding some air in these tires using our metaphor. We embedded um, mental health and case management, started working on family that was needed. Um, we, we, we established our first walk through the wild in 2018, which is about a quarter of our income now. Um, and then you know, really looking at shared and supportive employment with, with, with the group. So we did some models there. We had our first graduating class. So who had been in the program for three years, graduated in 2020. Um, we started hiring CWC grads as our, as our staff because that's who, that's who can help you the best if you've been there. No good for Kim Mascara to say this is how it should be. This is what the research shows. It's much better to have somebody that's really lived it. So, um, so last year, these are all the stats for, for last year. Um, one thing I'll, I'll draw your mind to is the six plus. 100% of our parents have, a, have an ACEs score of six plus. So those of you that know what adverse childhood events scores, if you have a two plus score, that will impact your health status. If you have a six plus score, it's a it's, it, it is, a, it is a, a real challenge. And that's 100% of the families that are of moms that, are, that have had that kind of historical um, health challenges. And so, um, so it's a, it's a big one, and, and this is why this support, this connection of this family that gets built from Choose Well over the course of years is so important. Most, a lot of these moms, this is the first time they've ever had a lease renewed, 12 month lease. I mean, these are big, big milestones. Um, so anyway, and 75% of our staff are Choose Well women. So um, we welcome fathers in 23. You know, the other thing was we found is people don't really want to donate 
for services that you could be billing Medicaid for. So reluctantly, we have done that in place this year. And as you all know, that's not a it's not a small lift. And it's not a small lift for not a large in, <laughs> income, but you've got to hopefully it will at least be a wash. So that would be good. Um, so you know, how can you help? Uh, there's some information about kinship works. This is this is uh, this is our um, employment model, supported employment model um, that we've put in place. So we got a um, we had some matching funds that came for that this year. Butterfly Investors is our ability to um, get folks to commit to, to donating for multiple years so that we can count on count on that investment. The master housing plan. There's some information about that. If that's something interesting to you um, in building up of how how do we actually perhaps maybe own the houses or or think through that so we have some real estate folks who are very interested in that and you all may be interested. Um, we could use help with our student intern program. Uh, weekly programming with the families um, is a great way to get connected. It's the best way on always just like you want to come and hold babies. It's usually an easy way to get people to volunteer. And then um, this weekend is our sixth uh, walk through the wild. This year it's at the Louisville Nature Center which is across the street from the zoo. Um, so if you are not doing anything on Saturday morning that's what I'm going to do before I go to the UofL game. Woohoo! Um, so anyway, choose all community. So, so, oh, 34 minutes. We get to do this. We really do get to do it. When I was in graduate school, people would say, well, when I have to do biostatistics on Friday night, I get to, I chose to, I wanted to. And it was interesting. And so that change makes a big difference. And so Marjorie Holmes did a lot of writing in the, in the, um, in the 20th century. I know most of you have been on that, but either way. Um, and she has a, wrote a beautiful devotional about the fact that when you look back, you can see all of the pieces, all of the stones, stepping stones that are taking you where you are. Looking forward is not as easy, but no matter what it is, we must do it well. And so today I'm here to talk to you about that. We I've tried to do it well, and I've done it with all of you all in this room. And so we've got a lot of work to do because we do this. Oh, thank you. So uh, please join me once again in co congratulating Kim on her significant contributions both to public health and the healthcare industry. Really enjoyed your talk a great deal. Uh, so thank you for being with us today and using your own voice to tell us about your very rem remarkable life and career. And on behalf of the University of Louisville, I have a uh, small uh, present to give you a recognition of your accomplishments. And uh, the state's 2023 alumni fellow, Kimberly H. Mascaro, MPH, in recognition of outstanding achievement in the field of public health and service to the UofL school. Thank you so much. Thank you.